All right, I see we already have one person introducing themselves in the chat, so feel free to do that. Um, I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, I'm Melissa Burrows at Families USA, and I am here to welcome you to our webinar um, along with Manat Health and Health Equity Solutions, um, Strategies to Drive Equitable Vaccine Distribution. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to drag on and the conversation around vaccines continues to evolve, one thing remains really clear, um, which is that equity needs to be at the center of vaccination efforts, and too often it is not. As health justice advocates here at Families and as people who care about you know, health equity and improving the healthcare system and um, you know, achieving the best health and, and healthcare um, for all in this country, now is the time to be really doubling down on the push for equity in vaccine distribution. And we're here today to talk about um, state policy levers and strategies to drive equitable vaccine di distribution and how to center equity in our advocacy um, around this issue as well. So um, on the next slide, I'll go to today's agenda. Um, as we've already started, I will be covering welcome and housekeeping. And then I will be turning it over to Kelly Murphy from Families USA with perhaps an assist from Audrey Richardson also at Families USA to talk about building a new normal through vaccine equity, sort of the overview of where we are. Um, then I will turn it over to Nina Punakolu and Michelle Savuto from Manat and Takesha Everett from Health Equity S Solutions to talk about specific strategies for states to drive equitable vaccine distribution. And then we will follow that up with a conversation with Ginger Kwan, the executive director of Open Doors for Multicultural Families, which is in King County, Washington. And she'll be sharing the community perspective, um, which is just so absolutely critical in this vaccine equity effort. And at the end, we will have question and answers with all of the panelists. Um, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat as we go along. We'll be keeping track, but we will answer them all at the end. Um, and we really appreciate having you all here with us today. And um, one final piece of housekeeping is that this is being recorded. Um, so, you know, A, you will be able to access the recording in the slides afterwards and B, um, that's the disclaimer that you need to hear. And so now I will turn it over to Kelly Murphy, um, the Director of Early Childhood and Maternal Health Initiatives here at Families USA, who is also leading our vaccine equity initiative. Thanks, Melissa. Hopefully you all can hear me okay. It's very fitting that I'm the Director of Early Childhood and Maternal Health right now because I am trying to do this presentation with a child in the room who just uh, was a little bit injured. So apologies if I need to have an assist from my awesome coworker, Audrey, but Hopefully you all will be able to hear um, everything that I say and let me know if you can or if something's wrong. So let's get into it. Building a new normal through vaccine equity. So this project, why are we doing this work? At Families USA, we really have two goals um, in this work that we are doing around vaccine equity. The first is to increase access and to reduce disparities in vaccine administration and distribution. The second, is really this marathon longer term goal of building sustainable infrastructure that will actually end up taking on long standing inequities in our health system. We do not want to create this work and all of this amazing vaccine infrastructure just to have it disappear, go away. We really want to be able to use it to think more about social determinants of health moving forward and trying to build a more equitable health system. We are doing this in a variety of different ways, and there's a lot of different angles to this work that we're doing, um, some of which you will hear about today. But really, we are trying to identify promising practices, and we want to work with our advocacy base to realize those promising practices, to spread them, to scale them, to change policy moving forward. We have some awesome partners in this work who you will hear from on this webinar. Um, Manette Health and Health Equity Solutions have been terrific in this, especially within thinking about getting the policy solutions to, directly to the state policymakers themselves. And then I also wanted to mention that this work is being funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Next slide. Awesome. So we have, as I mentioned, a bunch of different project components, and I'm going to keep this 
short, um, we have a lot going on. I think our project is really grounded in convening national leaders, certainly through webinars like this with all of you. And also we have a really robust advisory committee to help us make sure that we are always centering equity in this work. Second, we are really trying to bolster our community-based efforts. We are providing subgrants and technical assistance to community-based organizations and statewide organizations because really we are trying to center the community. Again, apologies for my lovely daughter who's chiming in. <laughs> um, we want to center communities. Um, it, community really should be, and this is our number one lesson learned in all of this work, that communities should be at the epicenter of vaccine equity. And I will say too, that we have seen time and time again that efforts that for vaccine distribution that are not at the community level, that are at the statewide level, they're just not as effective as those community-based solutions. So this is a really big, important component of our work. Third, we really wanna elevate local voices to state policymakers. And this is where the work of Manat and Health Equity Solutions really comes in. It's taking the lessons that we've learned from our community partners and the people on the ground doing the work and taking that information right to state policymakers. And then last, we are connecting and supporting states and local advocates through a monthly learning collaborative um, where we are trying to talk about hot topics. As you all know, everything with this issue changes, oh, every minute. <laughs> um, so we're really trying to engage folks on a variety of different topics. Next slide. I wanted to show this because we are doing some subgrants um, through our work, and we are doing some, some research and some focus groups in five different states, and I wanted to show it on a map. So we are funding organizations in Alabama, Arizona, Illinois, North Carolina, and Washington. And really the goal here is, again, all about the community level. How can we identify and help contextualize for policymakers what the community needs in order to increase equitable vaccine distribution. And then we're also, as I mentioned before, trying to help community-based organizations, statewide policy organizations, build and sustain that infrastructure so that we're not just addressing the vaccine issue, we are also thinking much more long-term about the health system in general. And then we are also trying to make sure that we are helping the community provide authentic, specific feedback to policymakers so that policy can actually be changed and they can be responsive to what is actually needed on the ground at the community level. Next slide. So in our work, as I mentioned, everything seems to be shifting on vaccines moment by moment. I'm not sure we even could have predicted where we are on vaccines right now just six months ago. But we at Families are trying to remain nimble, but also focus on some core issues that really center equity in this issue. And so these are the five topics that we are going to be focusing on um, moving forward. Of course, now in addition to my child, I have a dog in the background. Apologies. Um, so first issue vaccine mandates. Everyone probably saw that the administration came out with a pretty sweeping vaccine mandate. And what we've heard from our community-based organizations is that equity was really not centered in that mandate. Um, so we are trying to make sure that the policies that we are pushing and the information that we're sur surfacing from community-based organizations gets at that core to figure out what, how do we drive equity into these mandates that actually exist. And then on the public health side of things, we are hearing from public health leaders that mandates do really work. And we have seen some news recently saying that mandates have increased vaccination rates. So there's a little bit of a tension here around them working, not centering equity necessarily, thinking about the long-term issues of trust and wanting to build trust in communities that are all kind of circling around vaccine mandates. So there will be more to come from us on vaccine mandates. In terms of vaccines and Medicaid, we continue to see that rates of vaccination and Medicaid programs are lower than individuals who are not on Medicaid. So some of the research that we're going to be doing is to surface the insights around that, understand what some of the barriers are, and how we can again facilitate policy change. Kids and vaccines. Everyone probably knows that school has started recently, and we have a huge chunk of the population that is ineligible for vaccines right now. 
But that being said, vaccines are on the horizon for them. So we see kids in vaccines, youth in vaccines, school in vaccines as, as an opportunity to get equity right this time. Let's think about the community up front. Let's think about the local level up front and try to implement some of those strategies first, as opposed to how we did it with adults, which wasn't necessarily the most equitable. Boosters in equity, another, another um, hot topic as of late. And again, I think this is where um, we will be talking about how do we center equity within the booster process as it was not centered really in the initial vaccine rollout. And then last, testing and supply, or testing and, and availability is, is tangential to vaccination. But as we continue to see more tests to stay in school strategies or follow the mandate or test, we're trying to make sure that testing is still accessible and available to people that need it. So testing is sort of another component of the issues that we're focusing on. So I got through all of my topics. Thank you for bearing with me um, on the, you can go to the next slide. Our fabulous, fabulous um, partners in this effort are so, <laughs> Manat Health and Health Equity Solutions. And Nina, I think I'm just going to turn it over to you for the next slide. Um, really appreciate you all sticking with me with this. Take it away, Nina. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Kelly. Really appreciate that introduction. Um, and if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Um, so as Melissa and Kelly mentioned, my name is Nina Punakolu, and I'm a senior manager at Manat Health in our New York City office. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Michelle Savuto and Patty Boozing, and we are all part of Manat Health, which is an integrated legal and consulting firm working on a wide range of different healthcare issues. And a little bit later in the presentation, we're going to be joined by Takesha Everett, who is the executive director of Health Equity Solutions which is a nonprofit based in Connecticut that's working on a wide variety of issues related to equitable access to healthcare. Um, next slide. And so as, as um, Kelly mentioned, together with Families USA, we have been working specifically on strategies states can use to advance equitable vaccine distribution at the community level. Um, we our, we use a variety of different components to inform our work, including uh, detailed literature review, um, state interviews with five different states, including Alabama, Arizona, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New Mexico. We um, built in insights from community-based organizations, drawing on both Families USA and Health Equity Solutions, who have been doing extensive engagement um, with all of you and a number of other different organizations. Um, so really appreciated all of those insights. We also conducted a roundtable with states and state officials from seven states to discuss opportunities, best practices, and remaining barriers to equitable vaccine distribution. So our work has culminated in an issue brief and webinar with state officials to share our findings. Um, and the work was published in early August through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's State Health and Value Strategy Platform, which works with states to um, provide technical assistance on a range of different issues and recently has been doing a series on equity. Um, so we were part of that, that engagement. Next slide. So before jumping into the strategies, I wanted to preface by just saying that the COVID-19 pandemic has been incredibly dynamic and vaccine efforts um, have also been shifting due to the range of factors that Kelly mentioned. Um, I think in particular, we've seen the rise of the Delta variant becoming um, you know, the, the dominant strain in the United States and the disproportionate impact it's been having on communities of color. We've also seen, as Kelly mentioned, the rise in vaccine mandates, as well as the new federal mandate that just came through. Um, and then the, the boosters and the other factors that Kelly mentioned as well have all been um, changing the dynamics around vaccines and the rate of uptake. So um, just wanted to preface that this is a dynamic issue. And we also recognize that there's not really one, one solution or a silver bullet for addressing vaccine equity. This is something that states have to address adopt um, in different areas. It requires really multi-pronged strategy, um, recognizing that you know there's, no, there's not one single reason why um, people might not be getting vaccinated. There are a range of different reasons and barriers um, that states need to address with, the, with their community partners. 
And then finally, underpinning each of the different strategies that we identified is a recognition that state efforts really rely on meaningful funding and collaboration with grassroots organizations and community-based organizations, as well as meaningful engagement with the community. And so as we're describing each of these strategies in a little bit more detail, we're going to be talking about um, what are the leverage points that different community-based organizations and advocates and grassroots organizations can use to engage with state officials on each of these issues. So in our issue brief, we focus on three different categories of recommendations. The first is opportunities for increasing access and addressing barriers to vaccination. The second is on combating misinformation and building vaccine confidence. And the last was around data and operational challenges. Um, during our presentation today, we're really going to focus on this first category of strategies um, and identify, as I mentioned, those leverage points that community-based organizations can use to engage with state officials. Um, and so as we go to the next slide, I will turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Michelle Cebuto. Great. Thank you so much, Nina. So the first strategy that we heard many states are leveraging is to place vaccination sites in trusted, convenient locations in order to meet people where they are. And by bringing vaccination opportunities to hyper-local spaces, states are seeking to increase access to and convenience of obtaining the vaccine, particularly for individuals who may be reluctant or face barriers such as transportation. Uh, common locations include workspaces, schools, places of worship, libraries, and community events. Many local vaccination clinics, as a result of community input, offer off-peak hours and are staffed by organizations with strong community ties and as well as members of their own community. Um, a leading example of this strategy is New Jersey's campaign to reach agricultural workers in the state's blueberry fields. The state partnered with federally qualified health centers to offer vaccination right there on the farm. And this program, which was a collaboration between the state's Department of Health and the Department of Agriculture, successfully reached members of this community, which was a key priority given that many of these workers migrate into and out of the state during the year. And as part of this broader effort, New Jersey launched mobile command centers in South, Central, and North Jersey to focus specifically on populations disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And as Nina mentioned, examples of lever leverage points for advocates and community-based organizations related to this strategy include collaborating with local and state departments of health and ap applying for CDC and other grant funding opportunities to support community engagement. Vaccination campaigns require input from advocates and community-based organizations because they have real-time understanding of what's happening in the community. And though our paper focused primarily on state efforts, we found that in order for these strategies to be effective, states must partner with the community. Next slide, please. Great. So similar to the first strategy, the second involves hosting mobile and pop-up clinics, particularly in communities that have members at high risk for adverse COVID-19 health outcomes, low vaccination rates, high social vulnerability based on the CDC social vulnerability index, which is a tool used by many states to allocate COVID-19 vaccine resources, and communities that lack public transportation or experience other structural barriers. We heard that pop-up clinics are successful when they're visible, widely publicized, and staffed by community members, particularly those who speak the language or languages uh, that are primary in that community. In Connecticut, the state launched a brightly colored mobile van program that drives around the state to provide the vaccine in local sites within communities and at local events. The state reported that outreach at community events and through the mobile van has been effective in part because community members feel more comfortable talking to mobile van staff uh, on their own terms and in their own language, and even found that people may circle back to get vaccinated at the vans if they're present in the same area for an extended period. Further, the state creates awareness a few days or a week before a local event through canvassing and messaging to broadly communicate that no appointment, ID, or insurance are needed to get the vaccine. Similarly, Alabama set up mobile vaccination sites in rural, area, rural areas and deployed National Guard members to canvass door-to-door -to, -door to offer vaccination for homebound people. Finally, advocates and community-based organizations may be able to leverage funding now available through the American Rescue Plan Act as well as work with state and local health departments on COVID-19 mobile vaccination initiatives. Next slide, please. Another strategy our team heard during our interviews is that the medical community can play a major role in promoting vaccination. 
the great majority of people look to their healthcare providers for advice regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. Therefore, healthcare professionals can leverage their expertise and leadership to build trust in communities and dispel misinformation and other concerns. Pediatricians in particular are a critical access point for families, and this is becoming even more important given that adolescents are now eligible for the vaccine. Additionally, providers in community health centers and federally qualified health centers hold a unique reputation as a trusted source of care for BIPOC. Thus, they are a key partner in promoting and administering the vaccine. Some example leverage points on this slide include working with the State Department of Education and Department of Health to connect community members with trusted medical professionals in a variety of settings and leveraging NIH funding opportunities to promote education and provider ed engagement in vaccination efforts. And I'll turn over to my colleague, Nina. So building on what Michelle just mentioned around the need to really work with local clinics, pharmacies, and family practitioners and pediatricians to support vaccination efforts, um, a, par a, a parallel strategy is working with and partnering and funding community-based providers to offer home-based vaccinations. Um, and we wanted to lift up that you know, the strategy has been most effective for states working with community-based providers to offer, offer these home-based vaccinations, recognizing that a certain level of trust is needed to let someone into your home. Um, we also found that um, it can be a range of different providers um, who work on this strategy, including um, pharmacists, um, EMS providers, community health workers, and FQHCs. Um, the strategy is an important lever, not just for people who are homebound, for, but also for people who might face access barriers due to either lack of transportation or lack of supports for childcare or elder care, among other reasons. Um, but we wanted to recognize that this is not necessarily a strategy that works for everyone. We heard from states and local partners that some people um, responded really well to the offer of having a home-based vaccination, while others preferred other strategies we've talked about already well, um, including mobile clinics or other local access points, um, not wanting to, to bring that into their home. Um, and then, so recognizing the wide range of preferences, we recommend that states work with community-based groups, including faith-based faith organizations, to first build trust in the community and then work with those organizations to identify those people who might be interested in a home-based vaccination or might have specific needs that would benefit from um, a home-based vaccination. We heard from two states specifically on this issue. Um, in New Mexico, they have uh, established equity teams through the National Guard um, who are tasked with delivering home-based vac vaccinations um, and also to provide vaccinations at off-peak hours. Louisiana similarly partnered with local health departments in New Orleans to provide door-to-door -door vaccination opportunities. And through their effort, they, they used um, community health workers from local FQHCs to um, uh, offer those home-based vaccinations. A few leverage points um, to support home-based vaccination include collaborating with state Medicaid programs to help create links to home-based vaccinations and um, also to create that linkage between Medicaid and the community health um, and community health worker workforce. And the second leverage point is applying to work with states and localities on home-based vaccination efforts that are funded through the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, next slide. Finally, the last strategy we'll talk about today um, is around states working with the federal government, localities, and employers to um, support employers offering paid time off to employees to get vaccinated or recover from the vaccine. Um, similar to the vaccine mandates that Kelly mentioned earlier, earlier this month, the Biden administration announced that the Occupational Safety and Health Administration will be developing uh, a rule that would require employers with more than 100 employees to offer paid time off to workers to get vaccinated or recover from any side effects from the vaccine. Um, we haven't seen all the details on this policy yet, including timing, but we expect them to be released in the coming weeks. And this is a really important strategy because um, the data shows that fear of missing work is a major barrier for many people, um, including many people of color. And so this can be a really effective strategy to increase vaccination rates. So as the requirement rolls out at the federal level, States will really play an important role in supporting implementation, including supporting the launch of vaccine sites at places of employment. 
Um, New York City recently implemented a vaccine mandate for certain sectors, including education and healthcare. And as part of those implementation efforts, they found that co-locating vaccination points at places of employment has been an effective strategy, particularly in the days and weeks just before the mandate took effect. So in order to um, best support the strategy and work with states effectively, um, some leverage points community-based organizations and advocates can use is um, working with um, state and local health departments to raise awareness about this new federal requirement, as well as support answering any questions, recognizing that you know, anytime something like this rolls out, we wanna make sure that um, the community really understands what the requirements are and their options for vaccination. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to the Families USA team um, for the next portion. Thank you so much, Nina and Michelle. Thank you, Ginger, so much for joining us. Um, and as I told everyone at the beginning of the program, Ginger is the Executive Director of Open Doors for Multicultural Families, which is located in King County, Washington. Um, and we are going to be having a conversation about um, her experience and her organization's experience working in the community to advance equitable vaccine distribution. And so Ginger, before we kind of get into conversation, is there anything else you'd like to say by way of introduction? Um, no, not really. <laughs> Great, all right. Well, the first question I have, um, and it's just so important as we heard from um, you know, our, our previous presenters to make sure that there are effective partnerships with the community and that um, community needs are being met in advancing vaccine equity. So clearly partnering with community-based organizations has been a significant lesson learned during this you know, effort. And what from your experience is working well when implementing these sorts of partnerships? Um, and what should local leaders collaborating with community leaders, um, or sorry, what should national leaders and state leaders collaborating with community leaders keep in mind? Yeah, and I think, you know, first of all, we need to understand is a community organization work together is, is a relationship based. So it takes a while, take a, quite a time to build the, the trust. And it's never been a transactional. Uh, it's very different from very often the, uh, the, the, the funders comes in and say, hey, we want to see this happen. So can you just do that? Right. So you are pulling people out from what they are doing currently and, and expect people to go ahead to do it. And, and it's, it, it's not about a money issue because the BIPOC community focus and also value the most is their relationship with the community they serve. And, and what we are afraid of is if the community we are serving don't trust us anymore because of the work you ask us to do, then very likely community organization will not partner with the community, will not partner with the, the funders or other community members too. So it is very important that we think about the trusting relationship that is really needed and the relationship building has to be much longer term, not thinking about one time or two times. Um, and then the other part of it is that I think very often the funders that are not focusing on BIPOC community or have not developed the relationship with the BIPOC communities have a harder understanding of how BIPOC community leaders and also community work. So it's truly important that listen to the community leaders, listen to the community, that it will be the key. And that also means that you're gonna bring them to the table from the beginning. It's not like we designed something, this is what we're gonna do now. So now you go ahead, uh, do it. And then we give you money, that's it. So it, it, giving you money that also go through the RFP process, right? You need to compete with others to get it. <clears throat> so it's very different from you know how community works there. Um, and and if, if we don't listen to the community, uh, trust them, right? then we will have a harder time to implement the vaccination um, because there are so many stigmas regarding to vaccination in the BIPOC communities. And from the statistics, we also know there are more people from a BIPOC community didn't get vaccination. So that means underneath of it, there are so many different barriers you need to know. And uh, we rely on the 
the community leaders or community organization like ours that have direct services, direct connection to the, the population we serve. And when they trust us and for us to deliver the message and work with them, really listen to the community again and to understand who they want to, uh, who want to get vaccinated. If they want to get vaccinated, how can we support them? So you got to have the support system available to these population uh, and then, you know, remove all the barriers like a cultural barriers and the language barriers. And then also make it so much easier for them once they want to get vaccinated, link them to the places right away. And so they, they know everything is set up for them and easy for them. We even provide transportation or transportation stipends for them. And in many cases, people who have disabilities need people to help them to register, need the people to, to ensure that the vaccination uh, station or the clinic or the pop-up clinic, mo uh, mobile uh, bus or something, they are available, they can go to them directly as well. So really think about in many ways, who are the population who needs support and what kind of support needs they have and break or remove all those barriers. And then is more likely they will be able to get vaccinated. So these are mm -hmm. things that the system has to change. You need to think about you know, what works for the community by listening to them and for them to provide feedback and you provide the, the resource to them. So don't ever expect any different outcome if you continue to want to do the same thing the way you want to do. <laughs> yeah. No, that it is very clear in, in terms of how everything has been working or not working. And I'm very grateful for you sharing that perspective. Um, and you know, you mentioned just now some of the strategies that have been used and that we heard about earlier in the program as well around mobile and pop-up clinics, around mobile. Um, vans around partnering with community health centers and trusted um, people in the community, whether community health workers or just community leaders and in different strategies and kind of meeting people where they are in the community. And so looking ahead, now that we have some of these things in place, um, what supports do organizations like yours need to help sustain these efforts? Um, or what other supports do you need that we're not even talking about? Hmm. I think that's a very good question. You know, first of all, what we have seen not working, I, I can share one example, is that, you know, King County has a lot of uh, metropolitan area, so urban area, and but also, you know, outside of skirt of King County, a, a kind of ru uh, rural areas, a suburban area as well. And the most recently we have heard that, that there is one um, healthcare clinic that is located in the urban area. And they got a funding, so they have this pop-up uh, mobile clinic. So they go to the suburban area, go into the rural area, and they set up in, in the community, uh, community college setting. And they expected that in that day, they were very excited to you know, gear up and ready to, to get people vaccinated. And they hope that they can get a lot of people. And unfortunately, all day long, they only get two or three students. And those two or three students are Korean students come from other country. And so they were so disappointed. And, and I think just from this example, they also learned that, you know, first of all, how much do you know the, the, the population in the geographic location you intended to reach out to? And who are the leaders or who are natural leader or trust the sources look in, the, in that location, in that geographic places, right? And they didn't think about that. And they, they did not even think about the language, you know, how do people are aware of it already or not, right? So, so learning from that ex experience, you know, there are other different ways that works better. For example, you know, if you, what, what we have suggested the county and also see them started to do is look at the map, identify the, the gap, identify the, the location, what language was spoken the most, how, how people congregated together in the geographic location and look at the vaccination rate. 
and then identify the, the area that has lowest vaccination rate and using the targeted message and also utilize the local leaders and pay them, pay them equitably to disseminate the information out to the community. And so when they do that, then they, see, they start to see more success over there. So what I would say is that, you know, think about what works. And, and also like if you think about youth, right? How do we target youth by, by using youth messages? So messages by the people who resemble them, who look like them, who talk to their language per se, <laughs> to, to deliver the message that was very convincing and that tend to be more successful as well, is really share the facts with people but not to tell people, oh gosh, how come you didn't get vaccinated yet or something like that and be, be kind and provide options. And what we see is that once you see more people talk about the benefits of being vaccinated, then those people who didn't get vaccinated, they will start to think about they need to do that. And, and we see that recently for some people as well. So I would say to support an organization, you got to have a more equitable funding. If we're gonna pull people out from what they are doing and pay them for that one hour, two hour, that's really not sustainable, right? So we need to think about from the larger scale, how do we um, partner with community organization already have the capacity, but you know, truly provide additional support for them so they can compensate their staff uh, equitably because otherwise too many, Nonprofit uh, staff are, are kind of working poor because we can, our wage can never compete with government staff. Our wage can never compete with, you know, larger organizations, right? Or we'll establish the foundation like that. And that creates also inequity just within our own workforce development for the nonprofit organizations. And these are the, the challenges we see, these are inequity we see that happen within the community, people who want to help people and yet they themselves trying to sustain their own life. And it's really challenging to see that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think other things uh, regarding to currently what Washington State is trying to do, I can talk about that more. You know, I see that you have other questions related. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that would be great. I think the last question I wanted to ask you was about, you know, what what is happening in in your county and in Washington State that you are advocating for and you're working on right now. Yeah, what we are advocating for basically is a, Get us at a table. <laughs> I think we want to be a diner with you together. We don't want to be the menu. And too often community leaders are the menu because the menu has been decided. But what we can do is we, if we are a diner, we choose the menu with you and you can choose the dishes that works for you. And we can choose the dishes that work for us and everybody will be very happy and, and be full, <laughs> well fed, <Yeah>. right? <laughs> So I, I think that's just really a, a thinking differently to give up the power, to share the power together because for the better outcome, um, we, we, need to we need to design the program together. We need to be able to um, come together to discuss what will work. If we don't do that, then what happens is that you see the train need to be derailed and then what happened is a whole train whole cart you know tumble over and uh, that it becomes disaster and we see that over and over again including now there's a mandate kind of going to come down to say that for congregation more than certain number of people even in the restaurant like 12 people or something then everybody need to show the vaccination card you know pretty soon in i would say in two to three weeks and they, they were doing the community engagement a lot, um, but we have to be very thoughtful. We have to be very careful. When they want to do that, did they even think about what happened to our organization? We have 50 staff and not everybody wants to get vaccinated. We had a hard time to convince some of them. And if we're gonna mandate that, 
What does that mean? And, and I know, I know that I, I, I know in America, people like the most is gonna sue somebody. <laughs> matter what right there's a lawsuit here there's a lawsuit there and we don't have that kind of legal capacity just within our organization we already have challenge with this kind of risk management and what happens when the staff refuse refused what what, what do we do or if we mended it okay so that means force them to resign or force them to do something and then if somebody to bring out a lawsuit what do we do I, I, to be honest, we don't know what to do with that right now. And also the population we serve in the community, these are very vulnerable population. Many of them, they are not be, they cannot be vaccinated. It's not because they don't want to, because maybe the healthcare issue or behavior-wise, they just couldn't handle that. And so as a result, have the government thought about what happened to this population? Does that mean that you're gonna isolate them? They cannot go out to meet with people. They cannot go to the public places. They cannot go to the, even the restaurant they like to eat or something. I, I think it, it takes more time to think and to plan and also implement. And not everybody will have the capacity go online to, to download their information, the vaccine card or something like that. And who will be the one who cannot do that? Guarantee will be the ones who need the most help the most marginalized population. Yeah, very, very good point. Thank you, Ginger, so much for joining us and for sharing these really critical insights from the work that you do and from the communities that you, you are a part of and that you serve. Um, and at this point, I'm gonna have all of the panelists come back on and we are going to um, take questions. And um, if you have, not yet put your question in the chat, please go ahead and do so. But I know we've gotten a few really good ones. Um, so I will um, get to those in a moment. I'm just sorting through what's in the chat here. Um, but I think I'm going to start with, um, there's a question about when, um, Manat, you all were talking about the National Guard distributing vaccines in New Mexico. Were there any, and so when you're from that example, were there any concerns raised by families? Um, we know that the presence of National Guard troops in certain communities could certainly impose fear, particularly thinking about immigrant families um, and would not be helpful to accessing vaccines. So uh, do you know more about what that looked like on the ground in New Mexico or how that might be working? Sure, I can, I can kick us off. And then Michelle, please feel free to, to layer on. I think that was definitely something that was identified as a potential concern. And in terms of ways to try and mitigate that, I think um, discussions of making sure that um, any troops are not wearing uniform and that they're paired with members of the community who can, you know, explain um, in, in, you know, in, you know, whatever language um, the community is speaking um, about kind of what the strategy is and why people are here and, and all of that to try to alleviate some of those concerns. And I think in a lot of ways, states have been turning to the National Guard, not necessarily as their first choice, but recognizing that there are workforce challenges and trying to um, leverage all the different resources they have. So being really um, um, specific about where, where it's most high value to use National Guard and where it might make the most sense to use another type of workforce is another kind of key consideration. Michelle, um, anything else to layer on? I think you've covered most of it. I, I know there's been a recent push in some states to um, uh, request that the National Guardsmen dress in plain clothes. Um, so. Thanks. Um, and I've got a question here for Ginger, um, which is, you know, as a small community organization, um, sometimes it can be really difficult to kind of address the breadth of all of the needs in the community. So could you talk about sort of how your organization um, identifies its priorities and also how you increased your capacity in this moment of crisis? Oh, I think you're muted, Ginger. <laughs> yeah, I would say we are very fortunate because four years ago, we started to receive some funding from our uh, Seattle Foundation, that's a local foundation, give us funding started to do civic engagement and community organization. 
and with that kind of funding grassroots organization becomes our you know another level are able to influence the policy maker and also through that work we actually develop a lot of good partnership with many other organizations in our community. For example, we belong to this group called the Racial Equity Coalition, and that are led by 14 BIPOC leaders and BIPOC serve the community. And then we also are part of this PARCAC group, it's called a pandemic and the anti-racist uh, community advisory group that has more than 80 entities, including government, including nonprofit organization and many other institute funders all comes together to address the pandemic issue. And on top of that, we also are part of a group called uh, Equity Reconciliation and Recovery uh, alliance. And so it's really through that kind of coalition buildings and be willing to share the, the thought with the legislators and with decision makers by writing letters to them, meeting with them regularly, and we are able to make a lot of differences. And when it one short example is that through this kind of collision, we actually change how they practice uh, their rental assistance funding distribution, and that include the community into their budget. That is a sep like a one third of their budget to provide rental assistance to directly to the community through the BIPOC CBOs. Well, that's fabulous. Thank you for that. Um, Michelle, you discussed grants from CDC for community engagement, and we have a question here asking if you could explain how to access those, and, and maybe others know as well. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know that the CDC has a, a page of frequently asked questions that address some of that, uh, some of those questions, so I'll put it in the chat. Um, Nina, do you have any additional uh, recommendations? Yeah, I, I just think, I think the CDC, the way that they funded it is through like a number of different partner organizations. So I think in some cases the money has gone out and so it's identifying kind of who might have received those grants already in your community and how to link up with them um, to, to um, uh, work on any projects. But I know Families USA and others have been keeping a close eye on these opportunities as well. So anything you can layer on Does anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I know in our region is through the Seattle Public Health King County, and we as member of the Parkat group I just mentioned are in the committee. So they form this advisory committee. I'm also one of the member there will be able to advise, you know, how the funding will be distributed out to the community or how they're gonna implement the 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 program, you know, through this uh, application, they got it, yeah. Great, um, and I see we have uh, another question here asking if anyone on this call knows if the OSHA rule will allow workers to take time off to get their children vaccinated or allow their children to recover from any side effects. I can talk about this one, this is Kelly. Um, oh, sorry. If someone else is popping on, but um, we can layer on top. It's just, I, uh, Nina, unless you have other information, we've been really closely following this to try to figure out um, if they are going to allow time off for kids' vaccination and for kid recovering from side effects, but I have not heard any clarification on it. Nina, do you have other information? We've been trying to find out. No, that, that was exactly what I was going to say. And just noting that all the details about this policy haven't been released yet. So I think hopefully in the coming days and weeks, we'll get more information. But at this time, I haven't seen anything um, about that. Yeah. Um, and then I have one last question also about children and vaccines. Um, and I guess just, you know, Kelly, at the beginning, you raised this, and this has come up in a lot of discussions we've had of just you know, that's kind of the next stage in, there's a lot of things under the next stage, but that's one of the pieces of the next stage in vaccine equity. And so what are some of the main challenges um, you all anticipate in, in ensuring that there's equitable distribution for, for this new age group when those vaccines are available? This is such a great question, Melissa. I mean, we are, we really do think that this is a way to get it right, hopefully, this time around. And I think 
I think like we've all said and echoed throughout this whole webinar, really going to the community level, finding out what schools need, what local communities need, what parents need in order to facilitate vaccination for kids, what information they need. I think we really are um, wanting to make sure that vaccines are disseminated through sort of regular channels that already exist. I, I, I don't think there's a, a, a need to build up tons of new infrastructure because kids get vaccines all the time when they're ages zero to 12. And so we want pediatricians to have access to vaccinations. Um, there are lots of issues that come up with all of this around packaging of vaccines and dosing of vaccines and um, storing them and all of that stuff. But I, I think that what we've seen is that parents need access to reliable information from trusted resources and then to the extent possible kids getting those vaccines through their sort of usual channels would be um, things that would really help with the, the dissemination. Others want to layer on to that? I think you really covered it, Kelly. I think um, just knowing that parents and guardians are going to have a lot of um, questions and making sure that um, trusted resources are available in the format and, and language and all the different ways that people um, want and need to access information, making sure all of that's available will be really important. And if I may just chime in here, I think of the school educators, they can be the gatekeepers. They can also be the door openers. Um, and, and so it's, I have a mixed feelings because we know there's educators who don't want to get vaccinated either. And so they mobilize the union to against that, to claim their rights. Um, and, uh, and yet majority of the people may be very interested in doing that. However, as parents, you know, put their kids out there, uh, there is a huge, worries and fear from parents to have their young children to be vaccinated as well. We have heard that quite often. So, and I don't have any answers there, but I do think these are the critical conversations that need to take place among the educators to think about um, how this issue can be solved and how, how can we protect our young children um, there is no reason why the young children will die or will die because of COVID, um, something we can prevent it. Um, so I, I just hope there will be more thoughtful and brave and courageous conversation between the educators and the system and also invite the families to have a conversation, provide them with facts and, and family then can make the, the right choice and good choices for their families. And that's just my hope, yeah. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, I know we're getting towards the end of the hour, so I'm going to wrap us up with some resources on the next slide. Um, and just make sure that you all that joined us today know how to get involved and um, how to you know, keep up this shared learning and moving forward to build a new normal through vaccine equity, both in the short, short term, where we're really pushing on vaccine distribution being equitable, and then also learning from this moment and how we can advance health equity across the board. So if I leave you with one thing today, I want you to really hone in on the fact that community is key and building these infrastructures and supports and tables with community leaders at them um, is really something that matters as we go through and go forward on this effort. Um, and we hope that you will advocate for and or use the strategies we discussed today in your local region and think about how these actions um, not only increase equitable vaccine distribution, but can and should be sustained to address other public health concerns. As we heard a lot from Ginger, you know, these partnerships are incredibly important with communities and they take time and energy and resources and um, are so important to be thoughtful in. And we need to maintain these relationships and partnerships that we've built to this point so that they don't lose traction and also continue to do better um, nationally and at the state level. So 
Um, that's what I want to leave you with. I also want to share a few resources. You can visit um, Families USA's project page, uh, which is linked on the slides. You can reach any of us at Families USA working on um, this project at the vaccine equity at familiesusa.org email address. Uh, we also host a vaccine equity learning collaborative in which we have discussions like these between state and state advocates, community leaders and local advocates, um, really honing in on these state level policy levers and how to advocate around them to improve vaccine equity in the short term and, and long term health equity more broadly. I'm going to put a link in the chat now to um, the interest form for that group if you are interested in joining the email list and monthly um, calls in which we have discussion about many of these topics we discussed today and more. Um, and again, you know, please reach out to us if you have any ongoing questions, if there's any resources you need. We have a number of products coming out that kind of dig into some of these upcoming policy problems and typical, uh, or not typical, um, but expected um, challenges we'll all be facing. So, you know, we will definitely be in touch over email. We'll share all of the resources from today, including the slides and the links. Um, and we work, look forward to working with all of you. So thank you so much for joining us today. And um, thank you for your interest in this topic. <laughs>